we're in this uh, series about Romans 8. Hope you're enjoying it. I, I know that I've been really challenged and inspired preparing these messages. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at one of the, the most loved verses in Scripture. If you look online, you'll discover uh, these lists of uh, favourite Bible verses, and usually kind of 1 and 2 are John 3.16 or Psalm 23. But usually about third or fourth position is the verse uh, that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, so we're going to read that verse and what I want to do is read it in two different ways and hopefully you'll see why. So I'm going to read it first of all uh, from the ESV and that translation kind of goes back to the King James Version and it translates the verse and we know all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. Okay, uh, so now we're going to read it in the NIV and we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purposes. Now the reason that I wanted to read it in two different ways is not only is this verse one of the, the most popular and favourite verses in the New Testament. Probably if I was to go home and, and look at some of our personal Bibles, some of us would have it highlighted. So not only is it a favourite verse and a popular verse, but what I've discovered as a pastor is that this verse can either be used in a hurtful way or a helpful way, depending on how we understand it and translate it. And I first came to realise this when I went to visit a young man in, in one of my churches and uh, he had been diagnosed with terminal uh, brain cancer. Uh, and that meant as well as losing his wife, uh, his wife was going to be left as a widow and uh, his two daughters were going to lose their dad. And as we were talking, uh, he showed me a letter uh, told you how long ago it was, this was before email, and uh, th this Christian who was trying obviously to help him and, and comfort him had ended the letter by uh, writing out in the first way that we read, uh, that way on the, the right hand side, and it was the phrase all things work together for good that was causing this young man a, a good deal of pain. Because you he, see, he didn't see that anything that was happening to him was good. He couldn't see that him getting cancer was good. He didn't see that how his wife becoming a widow was good. He didn't understand how uh, his children losing their dad was good. He couldn't understand why God would give him cancer, never mind it being something good. And so this verse that, that I know somebody was trying to help him with, instead of being helpful, had been incredibly hurtful to him. And uh, over the, the last 30 years, I've seen that happen time and time again, that, that, that somebody's in a tragedy and someone quotes this verse, and instead of helping them, it hurts them. Uh, and so... Let's think about this. Is God's word really saying that whatever happens is good? The, the, the way that the King James Version sort of infers. Is it saying that suffering and evil and tragedy are really good? No. Is it saying that everything will, will work out great if we've just got enough faith? No, I don't think it is. Here's the good news. I don't think we need to understand this verse in a way that's either going to be hurtful to our faith or to someone else's faith by thinking that it teaches us that God uh, makes bad things happen in our life but just tells us to think that they are really good. Uh, and just to show you that I'm, I'm not way off 
uh, or in my thinking about this verse, John Stott, one of the most careful interpreters of the New Testament, said this about what we're thinking about. He said, the familiar King James translation of all things work together for good is surely to be rejected since all things do not automatically work themselves into a pattern of good. So I, I won't go into all the grammatical reasons here, but I think that the NIV translation of this verse is not only the better translation, but it helps us to use this verse and think about this verse for ourselves and for other people in a way that's helpful rather than hurtful. So now what I want us to do is have a really good in-depth look at what this verse teaches us. And the first thing that it teaches us is that God works. There are so many things that I don't know. So many things that I find confusing. So many things that to me are perplexing. I don't know why that young man got brain cancer. And he was a friend. I don't understand why my dad got dementia. I don't understand and I'm really confused why a friend who was a missionary just recently left his wife to move to Vietnam to be with a woman that he met online. I've got a whole list of things in life that, that I don't understand. And, and sometimes people ask me as a pastor, well, why did God allow this? And, and often I've got to say I don't know. I'm in it with you. I, I don't understand. When, and when there's so much in life that we don't understand and we find confusing, as Christians, we really need to gravitate towards and hold on to the things that we do know and we can understand. And that's what's happening here in this verse. God's word says, we know there are some things in life that despite all the confusion and everything that's perplexing, there are some things in life that we can know. So let's think about what they are. And the first thing that we can know, as we just said, is that God works. God isn't in heaven twiddling his thumbs. God isn't sitting looking at your life as some sort of passive spectator. God is at work. God works in our lives. He's at work in your life right now. What God wants you to know is that whatever is happening in your life right now is that he is energetically, ceaselessly and purposefully at work in your life. Now, you might not be able to see what he's doing, and, and right now you might not understand why he's doing what he's doing, but right here, God says in his word, you can know that God isn't absent from your situation. He is at work in your life. Okay, so what's he doing? If he's at work in our lives, what's he up to? Well, we can know what the purpose is. What's behind what he's doing? He's working for the good. He's working for your good. But there's a problem there. How we understand the word good. Because you see, most of us uh, understand good to mean things like health and happiness and money in the bank and a nice place to live and pleasant experiences and good friends. Uh, if you're from the UK, you might remember there was a comedy uh, show on in the 70s called The Good Life. And I think if you ask most people around us what a good life is, they, they would talk about a, a life that was relatively problem-free and comfortable. But the problem is that that's uh, not the biblical view of what the good is and what a good life would be. If you think that God is working in your life to make you happy, wealthy and prosperous uh, and comfortable, I've got to tell you, you're going to be disillusioned very quickly. Now, we don't need to wonder about what this good thing is that God is working for 
in our life because Paul talks about it in the very next verse when he says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Now, I know that the idea of predestination is very controversial. And yes, some of us in Westlake are going to have different ideas about that, what that means. But right now, I, I want to kind of push the controversy about what predestination is all about uh, to the side for a moment and think what its purpose is. What is God doing uh, through predestination? What does he want to achieve uh, and verse 29 makes it very clear. Uh, you and I have an end to which God is working towards. And the good in our life is that we are conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate good for us. Not to be happy necessarily, but to be holy. To be made more like Jesus. So when we are told that God is at work in our lives... He's at work for our ultimate good and that ultimate good is for you and I to be shaped, to be conformed, to be more like Jesus. And that's what God is working in your life at the moment to do. That's what he's wanting to achieve. That's what he's wanting to work with you on. So let's think about the next thing that we can know. So God is at work. He's at work for our good. And where is he at work? Well, he's at work in all things. God is at work in your life when positive things happen. But he's also at work when difficult things happen and tragedies happen, when we experience hard times and suffering. Now, I need to be clear here. Uh, there's nothing good about illness. There's nothing good about someone we love dying. There's nothing good about a marriage falling apart. There's nothing good about losing a job. There's nothing good about being anxious and depressed. And that's not what God wants you to think. What God wants you to know is that even in all things, even in those bad situations, God can work in those bad situations for Good. And remember that good is to make you more like Jesus. Most of us have probably heard of Joni Erickson Tara. Uh, this young woman has had all of her life ahead of her and then she had a tragic diving accident that left her in a wheelchair, quadriplegic. Now, was what happened to her good? Do we have to believe that God caused that to happen and it's good that all things are working together, that it's good? No, I don't think so. I don't think it was good that she had that accident. I don't think God caused it to happen. We might struggle with why he allowed it to happen. But Joni talks very clearly about how God has worked in her life through that bad, tragic situation for her good. And how that he's worked with her in her life in that bad situation to make her more like Jesus. In fact, to work through her life to make other people more like Jesus too. And so God is able to work in bad situations to bring out good outcomes, to make us more like Jesus. Listen, even when we blow it personally, even when we make foolish mistakes, even frankly, when we sin willfully, God says he can work in all things, even those things. God says that that bad thing doesn't mean need to be the thing that defines and shapes you for the rest of your life and lives. Because God can take even that thing and work in it and work through you and bring out the good that can make you more like Jesus. And so I, I, I want to hold on to the truth implied here that because God works for the good of us in all things, we can know that even our failures are not final. 
that God can even use the wreckage of the messes that we make in our lives to help make us more like Jesus. And of course that also means that our suffering and our tragedies don't have to be meaningless and pointless. God can work in them to make us more like Jesus. So the final thing, who's God, God going to do this for? Uh, this isn't a promise for everyone. We, we thought about this last week here in Romans 8. Uh, the promises God is making here are for his people. God is not working in this way in everyone's life. He's not working for the good of those who are living in rebellion against him or even those Christians who have decided that they won't live for these purposes. This promise is given specifically for those of us who love God and have responded to his call to give our lives to him and live our lives for him. This promise is for people who come to God and say, I love you, Lord, and I want to live for your purposes. And I won't always get it right, but I want to do the right thing. I want to follow you. I want to trust you. I want to live for you. And whenever we say those things to God and whenever we put our lives into his hand, it doesn't mean that we won't mess up ever again. We'll still make bad decisions, but God promised here is that he can even work in the messes we create and the suffering that other people cause in our lives to bring out the good, to make us more like Jesus. So what we've been trying to do in these sermons, at the end, we've been trying to think of a bottom line. One thought that you can take away and, and really take to heart and remember and live out about these uh, uh, incredible statements in Romans 8. So what's the one uh, for tonight, for this verse? Here it is. God can even use what he hates to accomplish what he loves. Did you get that? God can even use what he hates to accomplish what he loves. God doesn't cause sickness and suffering and divorces and hardship and violence and sexual abuse and sin. He hates that stuff. Those things are caused by the fact that we live in a fallen world impacted by sin, that we both sin and we are sinned against, that we have an enemy who does have power, Satan, who wants to draw us away from God and destroy our lives. And God says that he hates all of that stuff. It was never his intention. God hates everything to do with sin and its impact on our lives. But God can take even what he hates. Sin, suffering and tragedy. And can work in and through it to accomplish what he loves. Making people like you and I more like Jesus. That's the bottom line. Isn't it tremendous? That God can take even what he hates to accomplish in your life what he loves. Amen.